Everybody has find, can find this uh, room. I've seen many people around still searching for the room, <laughs> their room. Um, actually, I'm missing also one speaker, so <laughs> that's why I, <laughs> I am still waiting a, lit a little bit. Um, Okay, I hope that uh, the speaker will come up <laughs> at some point, will turn up at some point. So we start this session, sorry for the slight delay, good afternoon to everybody, and welcome to this session on open data. Um, uh, open data is a, is a buzzword now, it's uh, quite uh, a trendy word in government and international organization all over the world increasingly recognize the power of data for improving lives through better policies and economic research. The global movement which advocates for free data sharing is known as open data. Open data is commonly defined as data that can be freely used, modified and shared by anyone for any purpose, any purpose, so even for commercial purpose. And this is one, for example, of the problem that we are having in international organizations in having a full open data policy because, of course, uh, reuse for com of our data for commercial purposes uh, is creating a legal problem uh, for, for our organizations. Accordingly, various principles, frameworks, and methodologies attempt to operationalize this definition and provide data publishers with practical guidance and tools to ensure that their data are open. In this session, the topic of open data will be tackled from different perspectives. Uh, we will have, I hope, four authors uh, presenting their papers today. Um, each author will have 15 minutes for their presentation and after the presentation, we will have a, a 30 minutes uh, question and answer session in which uh, you, the, the participants, can ask a question and make comments on the papers and the uh, presenters uh, will be happy to reply to your questions. Now, the uh, session, as I mentioned, uh, has um, four papers foreseen. The first one is from Dr. Rajender Parsad who is the principal scientist division of design and experiments of the Indian Agricultural Statistical Research Institute. Uh, the title of the paper is Research Data Management in Indian Agricultural Research System and its Accessibility. Um, I have a short summary of his paper, but I think it's better that uh, the presenter himself uh, introduces the paper. So, uh, sir. Over to you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the chair. Good afternoon to all of you. Uh, I welcome the chair and the dele uh, delegates on behalf of the organizing committee because I have one of the organizers. Therefore, I have the responsibility to welcome you all once again. Uh, basically, as the chair has introduced the open data, open data is basically uh, which can be used for any purpose by anyone for the betterment of the interpretation and betterment of the humankind. That is open data. But in research data repositories, uh, there are some constraints in bringing the open data uh, definition to real open data. Therefore, there are some constraints which we have taken care of. But the first thing for the open data is that first data should be available. Then only it can be made open. Therefore, the effort in this is to bring that research data at one place. And partly it is open, uh, part of this data is open and part is under restricted access. This is basically a uh, data repository for Indian Council of Agriculture Research. I think by now all participants should have been aware about the Indian Council of Agriculture Research. It is the largest national agriculture research system uh, throughout the globe in a country uh, which has uh, 111 
institutes on different crops and commodities. There are 78 All India Coordinated Research Projects which run on different crops and commodities. Besides this, there is a strong network of more than 670 Krishi Vigyan Kendras through which a direct interaction is there with the farmers uh, for the technology transfers. The idea was to create a research data repository for knowledge management and the name given is Krishi Portal. Uh, it is knowledge-based resources information system hub uh, for innovations in agriculture. Uh, topic which I have given for uh, this uh, presentation is research data management in Indian agriculture research system and accessibility. It is available at uh, kirshi.icr.gov.in and we have direct link with government open data platform data.gov.in. In our country we have a open government data policy through which we put it and as a statistician let me say uh, quote Edward Deming who said in God we trust for all other things we must bring the data. Therefore data is important. We have a Government of India policy, National Data Sharing and Accessibility Policy, which came in 2012. Uh, then th uh, this uh, policy is being implemented by our Ministry of uh, Electronics and Information Technology. And there is a data.gov.in is the platform where all government departments op ac uh, open data is available. And at present, the emphasis is to make all open data through web services so that uh, updation of the data is not a problem so that if one ministry is changing the data that automatically becomes available at data.gov.in whichever data is to be shared in open access. Then CGIR as has been said has open access and data management policy which came in 2013 mainly on information products not really on data. We have our open access policy mainly for the publications. Then we have guidelines. I don't say that there is a policy for research data management. And then we have ICR data use license because research data is there. Therefore, there some restriction is there uh, on the uh, commercial use. And ICR guidelines for quality research data execution because whatever data is available, even if you make available in open access, if it is not of good quality, it cannot lead to better conclusions. This is how we are implementing. We are having six repositories, experimental data repository, survey data repository, observational data repository. These are unit level data repositories and these three are outcomes. Publication repository, technology repository and geo portal. And whatever we are trying uh, to put this in data is following the principle of FAIR. FAIR stands for data should be findable, it should be accessible, interoperable and reusable. Uh, as I discussed that there is some data which is in open access and some in uh, restricted access. This is how we are handling standardization of formats and common tables. All India coordinated research projects information systems, experiment data repository and data inventory repository. Observational data repository basically land use and uh, weather data. This is in complete open access. ICR geo portal which is special uh, data. Uh, in terms of thematic maps and the coordinates, a combination of restricted and open access. Publication repository is in open access. Technology repository is in open access. Video audio galleries are in open access. Single window uh, or gateway to ICR institutes, ICT initiatives, whatever is available at different institute websites that is given through a single gateway at one place. Uh, this is workflow authentication levels because if the data has to be there in open access, somebody has to upload the data. And this is how, what processes we have followed. Every researcher in the National Agriculture Research System is the user. They have authentication levels using our government ID and they can upload. And then there is officer in charge data management to ensure the quality of the data uh, before it comes to the open access. Uh, at every institute level, therefore they reviews the data submitted and then it uh, either it gets approved, comes to the open access or the repository or it's sent back to the notification with the submitter if there are some improvements required. Uh, the first one is our publication data in inventory repository. I'm happy to say that more than 23,000 publications are available from 107 institutes in open access. They can be downloaded and used. Uh, I'm happy to share again that there are more than 4,50,000 downloads across the globe has already happened for these 23,000 publications and our publication repository is indexed in open uh, directory of open access repositories and as well as in Google uh, Scholar as well as in Byfield uh, search engine. Then 
we are also doing uh, one more thing, harvesting the metadata from open access publication repositories through Interportal Harvester, uh, which ever are following the open archive initiative protocols. 26 repositories we are harvesting, and as on date, more than 4,87,000 records are available for unified search. Therefore, for literature search and for other search, this is a very good resource which one can make use of. Technology repository, which is so important, whatever output of the research organization is there, it has to go to the farmers. It has to be available in real time to the farmers. Therefore, all technologies are in real open access. They have been linked with data.gov.in, and at present, details of 560 technologies in public domain and 70 are in workflow process, and we are working on other technologies, and I am hopeful soon they will cross 10,000 mark. Then we have all India coordinated research projects. All technologies are generated for region specific and crop commodity specific through these projects, uh, which are spread across the country. Uh, therefore, their data has to be at one place so that uh, uh, this data can be reused for better conclusions and uh, metadata analysis can be performed uh, for combining into all these into place. We have 78 all India quantity research, research projects and their all data is coming to these repositories. We have developed the prototypes and implemented for few for the time being. Data sharing uh, by the researcher is really a Herculean task. Therefore, we are trying to sensitize the people for the importance of the open data and data sharing. Therefore, it is coming. At present, five ECRIPS are in full swing. These are some of the screenshots. This is uh, information system where for the research, for those who are interested in research, this system is allowing data collection, analysis, reporting, randomized layout of design generation, conducting the design, uploading the data, and finally preparing the reports. And believe me that this has saved a lot of time, digitization has saved a lot of time. In one crop, there are five people who used to spend three months for collecting the data at one place, preparing the reports. Now that time has reduced to three days. Three months to three days of five people. Therefore, we can say almost 15 man months every year for one ACRIP has been saved. Therefore, 78 ACRIPs, now we, it can be multiplied. Observation data repository, whether we have our weather data, it is from different ICR institutes, wherever weather stations are there, that data is in open access, and we are syncing it with other research repositories in the council. Basically, idea is through web services synchronization so that it remains updated. Then we have a geo portal where uh, more than 100 layers from 15 themes, particularly all soil data, soil themes, soil uh, depth, soil uh, uh, salinity, so, uh, soil texture, everything about the soil is available. Then we have crop residue burning data in the real time from, uh, no, uh, I can say October 1, 2018 till date. This data, all data is available point wise for all the states. Then we have a online information system for providing an easy interface to access important climate change information with respect to plant genetic resources. Because climate change has to be controlled, then plant genetic resources are going to play an important role. And this has been uh, overlaid with sen different scenarios of climate change. These are some of the screenshots for the maps, soil map, soil erosion, soil depth, and there are many more. And for ensuring interoperability, we have created master data tables as web services, which we are sharing across the national agriculture system so that any information system is developed, they use these master tables. And for commodity, we have used uh, agriculture information management standards of FAO uh, in these master tables as well for commodities. Then there is a single sign-on authentication. Uh, through single window access, there are more than 350 online resources available under 16 broad categories. And I'm happy to say there are more than 1560 videos, 1560 videos are available in open access at one place with a search facility on commodity on uh, any keyword. Then there are mobile apps, which is has to be in open access, which has to reach to the farmers, basically the they are the main users. 229 mobile apps ICR institutes have developed and those are available in open access and their download links, they are available at this portal. Then we are going through the capacity building and sensitization. We already have data use license, quality research data execution guidelines, but all these need legal framework, those we are developing and bringing together all guidelines on data management is also we are working on. 
we have more than 150,000 page views across more than 650 cities of 108 countries on this portal, more than 43,000 page views on the publication repository, and more than 4,50,000 downloads. Uh, this is being uh, indexed, indexed in Google Scholar, Byfield Academic Search Engine, Directory of Open Access Repositories, the Global Forum for Agriculture Research, GFAR, also has a access to this, and Open Government Data Platform. All these are data sets are being shared through web services because that is the order of the day. If data is not shared through web services, that will remain uh, will not remain updated. Therefore, we have to remain updated. Data has to be shared through web services so that it can be properly made use of by other applications, whichever want to use it. Because if data is not in web services, for making use of that data is again an issue to convert the data in the usable format. Issues are same as global level. Importance of open data or research data repository is not fully understood by the managers or the researchers. They think that this is yet another activity. Sensation is going on at the global level, and I think everybody will agree that this is important. Uh, then there is a reluctance to share concerns about the possible use of data by others without credit. Ownership claims, this is my data, why should I share? On this, I can say that once you publish in open access, our stamp is there that we have shared with this data. Therefore, we should not be worried about this. Then licensing and copyright issues with published papers are there. But whatever data gaps, whatever open data, whatever data quality we are talking about, but main questions as statistician we have to answer is, a farmer in a village should know what is the best possible yield in his, his or her area, how different it is from the India best, that is global, the country where the farmer is, it is best, global best, and why. This gap analysis informs him or her how to improve productivity. Another question which we have to answer is, he or she should also know what is the best price of produce, location of availability of the quality inputs and services, modern agriculture technologies in his her area to improve productivity, income, and sustainability. I'll skip through these uh, questions because time is short uh, for analytical questions, but those are important for innovations and for use of data. We have to have the information. We have to have the insight. We ha had to know what happened, what is happening now, and what will happen uh, tomorrow. Therefore, these all three questions as data analytics platform we have to answer through whatever data becomes available. This is the advancement in analysis is taking place. In agricultural sciences, particularly at research level, the role of data repositories in identifying the genotypes, phenotypes suitable for biotic, abiotic stresses, management practices that are resilient to climate change and ensure sustainable production. And at farm level, it should be able to tell us about crop health and soil health analysis through remote sensing and Internet of Things, farmer advisory services or input control, and market demand prediction, precision farming, mega environment mapping of crops, policy planning, crop planning, what to grow, when to grow, why to grow, agromet advisories, and finally, we have to come up with location-specific agromet advisory to the farmer. Once this data becomes at one place, all layers can be overlaid together. And finally, through this use of remote sensing data, use of soil data, use of research data, all data can be overlaid and uh, inferences can be drawn on location-specific advisory providing to the farmers at individual level. Uh, therefore, we need methods to combine multiple complementary data sets, maybe spanning different sectors, and beyond just meta-analysis of similarly studies can be done, but more problem will come is of small and large P. Data points are small, but we have to deliberate on large number of parameters to be estimated from that data. Therefore, that we have to handle through big data analytics platforms. Uh, this I can skip through. Basically, strategies are that we have to, we have the incentives and cultures need to be developed. If we need to have research data repositories, if we need to have to share those data, we have to have the incentives and culture need to be developed. Our mindset has to be changed. That this is my data, why should I share? We should be ready to share the data with others. We need to organize ourselves, convene, and inspire. And to conclude, I would like to say, data science and big data analytics, Internet of Agriculture things, help us to capture big data, and in upcoming, uh, de uh, decade, the farm will be a great source of data through all precision farming equipments, all sensors placed in the 
forms, that data will come in the real time. We should have a capacity and infrastructure to store that data and draw the real time conclusions from that data along with historical data overlaid on this. With this, uh, uh, we are moving towards, with this repositories, we are moving towards integration of developed repositories, ensuring in interoperability with other information systems through APIs, uh, then dimensional modeling and visualization of analysis of data. And finally, we have to develop web applications for providing location-specific, on-time, and data-driven information advisories, crop mega-environment mapping, crop planning, predicting phenology, generation of sowing schedules, and contingency plans using artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms. With this, I thank you all for your uh, patience, for hearing me. But at the end, I will say that uh, we are talking about open data and sharing data, and I would like to quote an Indian saying that gyan baatne se hi badta hai. If there is knowledge, if we share it, it, it will benefit us only, not, to whom we are, not only to whom we are sharing, our knowledge will increase. Therefore, let us share whatever we have with us, with others. Thank you. Thank you very much. presentation but uh, I'll uh, I'll wait for okay. the final um, uh, moment the, the session for question analysis okay so let's move to the uh, we change a bit the order of the uh, presentation we will have now uh, dr. Burama Mane uh, presenting he is currently the head of the IT office statistics and demography of the National Statistical Agency of Senegal and has extensive experience in the application of information and communication technology to statistical data collection. The, the title of the paper is Proposed Methodology to Anonymize and Disseminate Survey Statistical Data on Link Open Data, the case of agricultural survey data. And he will show the application he has experienced in, in Senegal. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gennari. Uh, the title is Toward an Open Policy of Microdata Dissemination in Africa, Lesson Learning from the Use of NIDA uh, Portal, the Case of Senegal. Uh, to introduce, uh, we say that the accessibility of survey data in crucial is that concern all national statistics office in Africa as responsible to collect and disseminate the statistical data all users need, and also are increasingly faced with growing demand for individual data or microdata. In addition to the pressing demand generally coming from uh, the research community and international organization, the NSO are also faced with their obligation to preserve the confidentiality of individual data. For giving an answer, some tools have been developed by partners between 2008 and 2014 to support developing country in improving the uh, achieving practices of statistical survey and data disseminating on web platforms such as the National Data Archive Portal. This web portal installed in many African countries can play an important role in facilitating microdating access and use. In Senegal, the NADA portal is now the main tool for disseminating microdata and metadata for statistical operation carried out by the national statistics system. Uh, we can talk now the problem for access to the microdata. Microdata are raw information directly collected from household, individual, or firm during survey on censuses. The specificity of their step type of data make their access for user a bit or more complex, even more difficult. Generally, the obstacle identify of an original from the level provision that must govern the dissemination of this data. Uh, at the level, we say that uh, the, the, the country have allowed that protects the dissemination data. The technical and logistical capacity need to ensure the confidentiality of individual information and how should be made available to users for optimal exploitation. At this level, again, uh, the data manager have to apply the anonymized process 
to, uh, to, to minimize the risk of identification and uh, uh, conserves the utility of the data. For contribution of NADA platform, uh, it is used to allow the researcher to browse, search, compare, request access to data, and download all relevant census and survey information. The ambition showed through this participatory approach is to make NADA a national platform that will, in the long term, centralize all survey conduct <coughs> conducted in Senegal. At the end of 2019, the NADA had uh, 1,013 documented and disseminated statistical operations composed as following. 89% for survey, 9% for census, 2% for administrative record. From the producer's point of view, 64% uh, of these operations are carried by INSD, the 19 by other sector structures that are member of the, the national system uh, statistic, 9% by research centers, and 8% by international organization. For this survey, more than 18 are disseminated on NADA from the years 2000. This graph showed the evolution of time of number of survey documented and published on NADA. So we showed that is not uh, very clear, but we saw uh, between 2012 and 2019, the most of the survey are be published on NADA. Now opening the level of survey data publishing on NADA, the accessibility of survey data published with the NADA platform is based on the following criteria. First is the completing and the updating of data, accessibility and dissemination format. For completing data, it refers to all survey information that may be of interest to users in understanding and using the data published on NADA. Thus, of the uh, 1, 113 statistical operation documented and published online, 20% of them do not have questionnaire, 37% uh, do not have methodological note or technical manual, 23rd do not display analysis report, 29% do not have the data dictionary. Concerning the updating of the data, this involves measuring the gap between the data of completion of the survey and his date of publication on another platform. Uh, concerning the uh, 82, 82 survey concerning by this, uh, the, this subject, we see that the, this difference is two and a half years on average. For accessibility and dissemination format, uh, we have uh, a type of access for file, the, the open access. We have direct access. The open access concern the data without restriction or authentication and in open format like ASCII or CSV, uh, SPSS, STATA, SISS. Public use file, the licenses file, the data accessibility only enclave, the data availability in external archive, and the data not available. That is the type of file we have in the NADA platform. So if for uh, our, our survey, we have, uh, you see, for the licenses file, we have 85 uh, survey that have published in, in NADA with the licenses file. The direct, the direct, file, the direct access we have, uh, we have uh, 12 survey, we have done publish. For the format of diffusion, the dissemination of microdata file, the exclusively used format are SPSS or, or STATA. This data uh, could be distributed in CSV or ISCII format, but also in Excel, especially in XLS. Prospect for more 
open access to survey data despite significant progress not in the documentation and dissemination of statistical operation in Senegal, the analysis of NADA users statistics show limited. It is not allow approval rate of requests, a long processing time, the unavailability of metadata for certain operation, the lack of diversification of distributed format, a way of its public survey mission, INSD has undertaken important initiative to promote easier access to individual access data. At the legislative and regular level, INSD introduced a significant reduction in 2012 on procedure and condition for access to microdata. Through the development of a new dissemination policy in the 2000, 2020 and 2020 strategy plan that will tie in with new trend in open data. The creation of access center for detailed statistics in university space. And, and, and the use of new diffusion technique in linked open data, the case of the directory of Senegalese locality available in the website. Uh, uh, this, this is the web platform we give, we give user to, to download the data uh, during the, the record. That is all I have to present it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. You, you finished uh, actually early. <laughs> um, now we have two presentations and uh, given the topic, maybe uh, it's better that I go to the uh, presentation that was supposed to be given by one of my colleagues that uh, unfortunately uh, cannot be present today. Um, and uh, it's on, uh, again, um, the uh, relationship between uh, microdata and uh, open data and the possibility of applying frameworks for the release of, uh, of, uh, of microdata. So where I... Okay, this is uh, a presentation that was prepared by one of my colleagues, uh, uh, Mike, Michael Raija and Anidi Oluakan Yode, um, that are both working in my office, uh, Office of the Chief Statistician at FAO. Um, uh, this initiative is part of a series of initiatives that uh, we have undertaken in my office to uh, increase um, uh, and to implement open data at FAO in different uh, aspects. Um, and uh, uh, one of these aspects is the, uh, uh, this the development of a corporate microdata dissemination policy, but also more generally of a corporate open data policy. While performing these two uh, tasks simultaneously, so a more general open data policy and then a specific policy for um, uh, open microdata, we found that there were some inconsistencies and that uh, um, uh, the frameworks that have been developed for the uh, more general open data uh, policy cannot be applied as they are to open microdata. So um, in this presentation, uh, we, I give a bit of a background of uh, what is the problem that we had to face. Um, we give an overview of the open data frameworks for the general open data uh, policy and how we have tried to adapt these open data frameworks to the specific situation of uh, publishing uh, microdata. And then uh, I will show you an example of uh, a uh, um, open microdata uh, base that we have just launched recently, uh, which is called the FAM catalog uh, at FAO, and uh, uh, that contains uh, already uh, over 400 um, uh, surveys, uh, agricultural and uh, food security surveys that uh, have been conducted by FAO or countries on 
on, with the support of FAO. And then the conclusions of this, uh, uh, um, uh, of this speech. So first of all, um, the background is that, uh, as I said at the beginning, there is increasing awareness of the importance of uh, uh, open data. Uh, the open data movement has uh, grown over time. Um, as you may know, there is a, a specific uh, um, NGO that is called uh, Godan, uh, who is uh, uh, promoting open data access for specifically agricultural data and nutritional data. And uh, this uh, Godan initiative was uh, initiated by the US and the UK government, but uh, uh, then increasingly had support from other organization and, uh, and uh, around the world, uh, in Africa, in other parts of the world. And uh, this is um, a very important uh, um, initiative because it tries to uh, get the political buy-in at the highest level on uh, uh, the importance of uh, opening up uh, the data assets. And this is a, an important step because when the politicians, uh, when the government uh, is convinced that uh, um, uh, the, 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 the data of any type, so both analytical research and statistical data, should be uh, made available to everybody to increase the knowledge and the possibility of use of this data, then also, the, for example, the national statistical offices and the other uh, uh, data um, providers in the countries are in a way forced to move towards applying an open data policy because most of the time we have to say that uh, um, national statistical offices have some resistance in adopting a full open data policy, especially for what it concerns microdata. Um, as I said, uh, this is, uh, um, we have uh, undertaken this work in the framework of a more general open data policy. We have examined various frameworks for the general open data policies and uh, uh, we have seen that uh, these frameworks neglect some of the key specificities of uh, microdata, and so these frameworks need to be adapted to the specificity of uh, microdata. Um, so uh, the, um, we have, uh, in general, uh, four of these frameworks uh, that have been developed at different uh, um, uh, stages, uh, uh, and uh, here we, you have the references uh, to th these frameworks, to th this more uh, widely and broadly used uh, framework um, uh, that have different characteristics. Uh, for example, the Tim Berners-Lee five-star open link data, which has a five-star rating scale for evalu evaluating openness and data linkage. Uh, the characteristics were the one that uh, were presented by uh, our colleague before, uh, Mr. Uh, Prasad. Um, and then there are other type of frameworks that have been developed more recently, the International Open Data Charter um, and the Open Data Inventory Scoring Methodology. Maybe you are aware of this. Um, this is called ODIN, uh, that is done also by a, an NGO that publish every year the degree of openness of the databases of uh, uh, national statistical offices around the world. And uh, it's a very interesting reading because you see uh, what are the uh, uh, governments that are and the national statistical offices that are more keen on promoting open data access and those that instead are uh, very uh, uh, cautious and uh, um, reticent in, in, in doing so. And um, um, there is a, a specific methodology that, by the way, just a curiosity, um, we have been working with the Odin team recently because since it was not considering um, uh, sufficiently uh, agricult food and agricultural data in their uh, uh, databases, so we have in 
uh, help them to include additional time series that relate to uh, food security, to uh, use of natural resources where that were not very present into the uh, uh, Odin scoring methodology. So the next edition of uh, the Odin report that will be published next year will contain also a better coverage of uh, uh, agricultural time series. Um, this is an overview of uh, the open data uh, frameworks and according to their uh, principles. And we see that um, they have some, at least uh, three of them, uh, characteristics in common uh, that can be so generalized as uh, common principles for uh, open data ac access. And again, uh, the, the, the adequate uh, metadata, the interoperability, the licensing, uh, the possibilities of reusing uh, data that are published, the machine readability, and the, non the publication in non-proprietary formats are important elements of all these frameworks. Now, how can we adapt uh, this, and what are the problems in adapting these uh, frameworks to the uh, specific situation of microdata. Let's first start with the metadata. Um, metadata in open data frameworks usually refer to data which do not originate from survey or censuses. Thus, the recommendation for metadata standards in those frameworks do not recognize the specialized standards widely adopted for microdata. And uh, I'm referring here to the uh, DDI, uh, that is the uh, key uh, uh, standard for the do documentation of uh, 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 microdata surveys. Um, and uh, uh, so the recommendation is to include the DDI as one of the key elements for organizing the metadata for surveys and ensure that every data set has metadata for a minimum set of DDI elements. Um, and of course, according to the different type of surveys, you can choose uh, the number of elements. We have seen that for agricultural surveys, uh, the minimum number of elements should be 13. The second element looks at interoperability. And what are the challenges here? Um, so first of all, of course, interoperability refers both to the data and to the metadata. Uh, microdata, however, contains complex data structures uh, and hundreds of variables of different types, which makes interoperability between them quite challenging, quite difficult. Uh, the metadata standards for microdata and other data types promoted by OD frameworks do not map directly. So the recommendation here is that we need to ensure interoperability through mapping the DDI standard to other well-known metadata standard, as for example, the DCAT. Also, uh, what is important is consistent coding of key variables and unique identifiers that may help users to merge micro data sets from different sources. Now we move to the third uh, aspect, uh, to so licensing. And the challenge here is that um, open data frameworks advocate for allowing unrestricted access and use of, of, uh, of data. Um, but in this case, since in microdata we have uh, the inclusion of personal level information, the terms of use for microdata must be strictly controlled to prevent users from trying to identify data subjects, so to pre preserve confidentiality of the respondents. So again, we need to change the, uh, the, the, the general framework for open data to adjust for the situation, specific situation of microdata. So the recommendations here are to strive for scientific use files with short, clear, and safe terms of use, and review and respond to applications for license use files as quickly as possible. Well, in a way here, of course, uh, we need to ensure that uh, um, um, data are anonymized. That's the first uh, element. 
and that uh, it, it's not possible, of course, uh, to retrieve the respondent through the combination of various type of information. And that's an important aspect of uh, the um, uh, open data policy for uh, microdata. Uh, in terms of uh, machine readability and use of non-proprietary software, um, uh, non-proprietary formats referenced in open data frameworks are ill-suited for microdata. Microdata need different type of software, and uh, um, often microdata sets are often hierarchical and contain categorical variables, and thus providing them in such formats we require coding which may be labor intensive and time consuming. Um, and so the recommendation here is to um, uh, disseminate the microdata in multiple formats uh, that are the most used formats by uh, analysts. Uh, so the state, uh, STATA, SPSS, and R data. So you user can have access to a w wide variety of formats and analysis according to their specific uh, uh, needs. Okay, so after having given an introduction to this uh, point that uh, we have gone through uh, in developing our um, uh, open data policies for microdata before publishing our uh, new uh, database of uh, microdata, which, which is called FAM, which stand for food and agricultural microdata. And uh, here you have also the link to the, uh, that uh, um, you can access. And uh, uh, this catalog was launched uh, in July uh, with the ambition of becoming the one-stop shop for locating all agricultural census and survey data, as well as data sets for food security. We, you know that uh, um, um, for example, uh, the IHSN, the International Household Survey Network, has developed uh, since a long time a, a, a catalog for all household surveys produced uh, around the world, which has been very successful. But in the field of agriculture, uh, we don't have anything of this kind. And so we thought that it was important to develop a database uh, giving the possibility to retrieve all the agricultural survey that are uh, conducted in countries. Um, in many cases, the survey are, are not, the microdata are not resident in our database if the country themselves are publishing this data. We just provide the link. So for us, it's just a, a catalog and a documentation of what is available and where this data can be found, not necessarily on our database if they are published by the country. There is no need for us to duplicate the uh, disseminations. As I said, we have at the moment more than 360 data sets, and uh, we are currently working with many countries to um, republish, as I said, since some countries are already publishing the, their mi micro data, to convince them to republish their data through our uh, database. And uh, as you can imagine, the uh, FAM uh, that, uh, catalog adopts all the recommendations that I mentioned before for adapting the general frameworks of open data policy to the situation of microdata. And so um, I'm coming to the conclusion of this speech. So the open data movement has had a major impact on the open data sharing of agricultural data and provided national statistical system with tools and standards to promote openness. As you know, um, the uh, World Bank through the ADP program and Paris 21, but also FAO are working on uh, f continuously improving this anonymization tool uh, and other legal tool to ensure that uh, um, there is not a misuse of the data that are published uh, in the public domain. Uh, and these are very important tools for um, ensuring countries that uh, uh, this data uh, will be properly used and, and there will be no breach of confidentiality, of the confidentiality agreement with the respondents. 
Um, the impo most important area of openness are those that I mentioned before, and I don't need to repeat here. Uh, although these criteria are also important for microdata dissemination, they are difficult to apply due to the specificities of microdata. And uh, uh, the paper that I uh, presented uh, today gives a recommendation on how each of these criteria uh, can be modified and adapted for microdata sharing and use based on FAO's experience and best practices from various international organizations. So thank you for your attention. And uh, now, I'm, now I'm calling my colleague uh, uh, Marie. Um, do you have your presentation also? OK, you can upload it on, on the uh, uh, computer. Um, this is a paper also produced by FAO, by a team in FAO. And I want to mention the people that uh, contributed to prepare this paper. Caterina Caracciolo, Valeria Pesce, uh, Mukesh Srivastava. Carola Fabi, and uh, Marie has been so kind uh, to uh, uh, agree to present the paper even if uh, she was not uh, among the authors of the paper. The paper, uh, the title is Open Classifications for Open Statistical Data. And as you will see, this is a more um, technical paper on uh, uh, metadata uh, standard and classification to be used for uh, uh, the dissemination of statistics. So, um, but uh, uh, also uh, these standards are so, imp so important for, for uh, uh, statistical dissemination. So, uh, Marie, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Pietro. So, uh, also thanking for doing the uh, introduction that I more, li more or less had <laughs> foreseen to do. So. Uh, um, so as uh, Pietro mentioned indeed, um, uh, I'm, I'm pleased to present on behalf of uh, colleagues on that uh, are uh, on an ongoing project that is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and that aims at improving um, interoper interoperability of uh, statistical uh, classification. So uh, indeed, uh, um, this uh, work is, is already, as Pietro has already mentioned, is led by Caterina Caracciolo, but she's uh, supported in this work uh, by Valeria Pesce, Mokesh, Svata, and Carola Fabi. So I, uh, the topic is a little bit uh, outside my area, usual uh, area of expertise. So I will do my best uh, not to divert main ideas, nor to smash technical concepts, but. Uh, so, uh, so please <laughs> bear on me. Okay. So actually, the presentation starts with the output of uh, the work, huh? so which is the Caliper website that has been uh, developed under this um, project. So, and I think it's really a nice idea to start from the output because uh, it gives a, visi um, a visual and tangible idea of. Um, of the output that maybe it's easier to comprehend. So basically, what is cal Caliper? So with Caliper, FAO aims at making statistical uh, classification available in formats that are fully machine readable and actionable, but also that are easily accessible to human, uh, humans for consultation and users. So uh, the platform has already been developed, it's uh, functioning. Uh, the only thing is that it is uh, password protected because it's still uh, at the experimental stage. So you are free uh, to go and to navigate on the website. But uh, again, you need to type in uh, the password with which is Caliper. Uh, of course, um, so as I said, you are welcome to use. But uh, please remember that all data are in a draft state, although the work is really well advanced, but uh, so it should not be used as a reference. And also classification that you will find uh, there do not replace uh, the version distributed by the man, uh, the original maintenance. It's just a world of cautions because it's uh, still uh, ongoing projects. 
Okay, so Caliper is part of a global uh, movement towards um, open and interoperable, interoperable data, so which means accessible and reusable data. And so here we are talking about uh, making classification um, open. So when we talk about open data, I mean, a statistician, we tend to, to think about the figures, the numbers, not the statistics, uh, that we should make it, it open. But actually, it's much broader than that. We also need to uh, make open the whole uh, uh, statistical uh, system. I mean, also, for instance, uh, classification. So open means, I'm sure it has already uh, been mentioned, I mean, it has already been mentioned, it's available and usable with legal rights and uh, interoperable data. It means that the data has to be produ uh, produced in formats that are machine readable and actionable with clear semantics. So what is the, is the advantage of uh, structuring uh, and transcribing uh, classification in those structured format is that you won't have lo any loss of meaning when uh, going from one system to the other. So you are not anymore working locally, it is web friendly, and, if we, and uh, so even if you go outside your local environment, you keep all the information. So of course the key notion is standards and metadata, and when it comes to classifications, the standards that is used is uh, the SCOS, standards, which is uh, standards that, is, uh, be, that has been uh, speci specially uh, developed to describe classification. I will come uh, later to a slightly more technical uh, description of what SCOS is. And um, uh, also it is RDF based. Uh, so uh, yes, again, I will come back uh, to this just after, uh, in a moment. Okay. so. Um, this is uh, the well-known uh, five-star scheme developed uh, by ten Tim Berners-Lee. So basically what we are doing with this project, we, I mean, I'm not, I shouldn't include me, we, FAO is doing, and my colleagues in FAO are doing with this prog uh, project, is basically working at transforming classification that are normally expressed in a PDF or Excel format, sometimes CSV, into those um, highest uh, step of the open, uh, in, in formats that are uh, compliant with the highest steps of the open data uh, lad uh, ladder. So this is basically the idea of, uh, this, is, this is fundamentally what is doing and what our colleagues are doing and what is behind the Calypso. So just for an analogy, for maybe uh, maybe to for some um, so maybe as the, uh, for, for an analo analogy to another uh, standard. So for data um, in statistics, sorry, for data we have the SDMX, uh, which is an XML-based standard for dis disseminating and sharing statistical data. And then you have the RDF Data Cube that implements the SDMX Cube model as linked data. When it comes to classification, so in the Caliper version, we are using the SCOS, not XCOS, the SCOS, which stands for Simple Knowledge Organization System. And basically, this is a system that has been uh, developed to cover the specific <coughs> needs of statistical classification. And basically, what is the main specificity of classification is uh, are the hierarchical, very strong hierarchical structure and also the, cor the correspondences. So on a technical note, so hierarchies within a classification and correspondences between classification are expressed uh, using the matching properties of the SCOS vocabulary. So statistical classification in Caliper are rendered as cost concept schemes and with cost being our RDF based standards. I'm going into the technical and I cannot go any further than <coughs> this technical. But so this is what is behind this caliper. There is a lot of work of uh, developing uh, classification um, into the standard uh, structure. So uh, as I mentioned, in, in Caliper, all classification have been developed uh, using the SCOS uh, standard, but now, uh, very recently, the XCOS, uh, which is an RDF vocabulary specific for statistical classification, has been endorsed by DDI. 
So the next release of the caliper, we will upgrade also to the XCOS because when we started the project, it was not yet, it was still under development, not yet finalized. So, um, but uh, the colleagues um, ensured that they knew about uh, the upcoming of the XCOS, so the upgrades will be very easy. And um, next uh, release again of uh, calip uh, in, in caliper will be uh, XCOS compliant. So this is for technicalities. Okay, some of the expected benefits of this work. Huh? So thanks to the adoption of open web standards, well, what we are doing is that we are achieving a uniform modeling of classifications and their content. Everything is much machine actionable because the semantics of the data is described in the standard. Uh, also, we have str uh, straightforward conversion formats and uh, it is possible to reuse existing tools. So everything that has been developed can be, or maybe if other people are interested to, uh, to use this material to, uh, for their own classification, I mean, uh, they can also uh, uh, use this. So back to Caliper, no? Uh, so what you can find in Caliper, um, it's an uh, open machine readable and linked uh, versions of various statistical classification, uh, like uh, I think the CPC. Um, um, so we have the food FAO food commodity list, um, world program of the census of agriculture, so the crop list of the world uh, program of the census of agriculture. So you have various um, statistical classification already in Caliper. Uh, you can also find uh, mappings. Mappings are not, uh, nothing other than correspondences between classification codes. Metadata, so metadata is, as you know, is data about the data. In this case, the data is the, classific the classification codes, so the, the codes, and the metadata would be all descriptive information around the classification codes. You, there are also some uh, tests ongoing within calips, uh, cali Caliper towards defining a uniform modeling of, uh, for instance, extensions. So, for instance, uh, you may know about the um, uh, CP, CPC 2.1 extension uh, for agricultural and uh, rural statistics, which is an official annex to the CPC that resulted from a contribution to, of uh, FAO to CP2 to CPC 2.1, but uh, for the moment this uh, is only published um, as a PDF. So here you will have in, uh, in Caliper, it is available in interoperable format. Okay, so this is uh, uh, basically an entry, she, I mean an entry pro point of in the caliper, so you can find many classifications. So this is a list of the kind of classification that you can find in caliper. For instance, Isaac Revision 4 is there, a few different version of CPC. So just so for again on a technical note, caliper runs on Cosmos, which is an open source web-based cost browsers and publishing tools that supports many supports uh, like search, browse, alphabetics, thematics, indexes, and so on. So, and it's implemented in PHP uh, JavaScript. Okay, and it's open source. So, so, uh, so basically it's the tool that enables you to publish everything that has been developed uh, behind in the standard. And uh, okay, so I will fin, I'm always uh, almost done with the presentation. Some functionalities that you will find in Caliper. So uh, there is an entry point for to classification. This is was just the previous um, uh, slides. But then also there is a translation uh, system so that you can show your languages and many, and the, some um, classification can uh, be displayed in uh, different languages. There is lookup services. You can also, uh, of course, uh, browse into the metadata section. There is search, uh, filter correspondence section. So those are uh, functionalities for dissemination functionalities for use. Uh, so this is more on the programming side. So there are uh, queries that is uh, using, um, this is possible to do queries to get, to extract um, codes uh, by using the SP 
PAQRL, which would be the uh, SQRL but, uh, system, but for LDS uh, system. So I am being a bit quick on those couple of slides because I want to, to go to my concluding uh, comments, which I think are important. So going beyond testing, so what's next? I have two more slides. So first, uh, of course, this work is very relevant for FAO. Some of the functionalities provided by Caliper may become part of FAO workflow, for example, to contribute to the maintenance of internal reference base for classification. Um, there is also, of course, uh, relevance for, uh, of this work for the community, because in the future, uh, publishing uh, classification in standards, machine actionable formats should become the norm. So each uh, custodian maintainer will publish their own classification with the reducing the need for duplication and um, in the user's information system. So ongoing, what's next? So it's to extend the coverage of Caliper to include uh, classifications maintained by FAO classifications used by FAO, but also to explore the possibility of setting up uh, networks of maintainers and users of statistical classification. For instance, uh, preliminary conversation started with Eurostat. I think my colleague is also in contact with UNSD because again, all this development work is useful for any agency that is custodian or maintaining uh, um, uh, statistical uh, classification. So I think, okay, I think this is the slide, uh, the final slide. There are a few pointers for those that are interested uh, to go a little bit beyond. And if you have question, uh, I mean, <laughs> I can try to answer, but uh, you will be much more lucky if you send an email to Katerina Caracciolo, uh, <laughs> which is mentioned uh, uh, on the cover. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Marie. Okay, um, yeah, maybe not all of you are, uh, uh, have uh, been, have realized the importance of this work, but um, classification tend to change over time, and uh, uh, the possibility of uh, seamlessly publishing data under different classification formats uh, is not, is a big uh, headache for uh, many international organizations and also, I think, at national level. So having a tool that uh, can map uh, seamlessly the different classification and uh, link it to the uh, data point, the time series, and so on, uh, is, is very important uh, for, for um, uh, the statistical work of any organization. Okay, we can open up the discussion now, um, and I'm ready to take any request of uh, uh, comments or question from the floor? If not, I can start because I have many. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the gentleman, yeah. please, please introduce yourself. Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Nachiket and I work with FAO India. Uh, I was just wanting to know if any work is also being done to open up administrative data of governments because that also has a lot of value uh, and uh, many countries also have right to information or freedom of information laws but very often a uh, lot of administrative data is not really put out uh, whereas it could be very useful in tracking uh, several developments. So I just wanted to know if there's any thoughts on that. Okay. Any other question? We collect three or four and then we try to reply. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I am Drijesh Tiwari, Deputy DG in the NSO India. And I have two questions for Dr. Ajahn Prasad. Uh, one is that uh, once you were mentioning uh, data repository, you mentioned that unit level data are there uh, for it pertaining to surveys. <laughs> and my question is what kind of surveys are included in that? And the second one is, uh, when you say that uh, inter-portal data harvesting facility is there, uh, how is it different from the technology perspective from uh, web scraping? Thank you. So the question were for me. No, not for me. 
Ah, <laughs> okay. Um, another question? Any other question? Yes, uh, our colleague from Ethiopia. Okay, uh, thank you. My question, uh, the first question is uh, for the first presenter. Uh, it's, uh, he presented uh, uh, about, uh, uh, my question is, uh, you have restricted access also. So what's the criteria to put the data on restricted access and uh, to make it uh, open? And uh, is uploading mandatory for all researchers or how do you initiate, or is there any incentive for researchers to put the data in your uh, open uh, access? And have you faced any problem by uh, respondents of uh, revealing their data by putting in the open uh, uh, portal. And uh, the, the for the Senegal presentation, uh, the anonymization may not work for some data. Uh, for example, for the business uh, farmers and some specific areas, uh, even though we anonymized, so uh, it's, it's, it's possible to identify the farm. So what type of uh, mechanism you put uh, for that one. And uh, the last one is just uh, appreciation for FAO for uh, working on these uh, uh, classifications. And so I hope uh, this activity will be finalized, the Caliper activity, and uh, it will be ready for use for countries. Thank you. Okay, so I think we have uh, already collected quite a range of different uh, questions. Uh, um, so I have a first question on uh, um, the possibility of opening up administrative data, which is quite challenging. Uh, I know of some experiences, but um, I have here in the room, uh, I think one of the experts on this field. Uh, Naman, do you want to respond to this question? <laughs> strategies there has been some studies that have been conducted on uh, administrative data it starts with uh, what we define as administrative data because this level of administrative data may cover many many aspects the second is the countries that have been successful uh, according to the experience that we have seen are countries that have a statistical a robust statistical law that allows access to some of this administrative data because without that we have many many issues that are involved so important is that second for statisticians to be involved in preparing administrative forms particularly to have a, a, an identification a unique identification of the unit because for those countries we try to do some record linkage and things like that you know that there is a, it's a very nightmare for many, many countries. Uh, so I think there is a big potential in this, what we have seen from the studies, but there are many issues uh, related to opening. And uh, the colleague from India said that uh, there are issues of uh, law in the country, the country law, the liberty of access, et cetera, et cetera. So the, st the first point is really the statistical law try to access first these uh, issues. Okay, if I may add to what uh, uh, Naman said, what was done was mostly looking at the conditions under which uh, administrative data uh, can be made open, openly available to the public. And uh, so what statisticians should do in order to uh, move towards that condition. Now, the experiences uh, in countries are quite few uh, in which there is a full uh, accessibility of uh, uh, administrative data. And, uh, of course, we have to learn from those countries. Uh, I'm thinking of Australia, I'm thinking of Canada, I'm thinking of Spain, uh, in which, for example, fiscal data uh, and the fiscal uh, declaration 
are used for uh, having uh, uh, income uh, information and uh, reducing the, um, the questionnaire for uh, businesses, uh, for example, or linking different uh, uh, databases uh, of uh, administrative nature. So typically Nordic countries are, uh, Nordic countries in Europe are uh, uh, very strong on that aspect and they are even uh, replacing all the censuses with uh, just uh, uh, merging uh, uh, administrative data of different kind. Uh, so the demographic, the, the social, the, the, the uh, uh, economic and so on. Um, so we, we need to learn from uh, those countries to understand exactly what were the conditions and what made this possible to uh, ensure that these uh, databases could be uh, made open. Uh, then there were two questions for our first speakers, I understand what kind of surveys you were referring to and uh, if this could be uh, assimilated to a web scrapping tool. You, you can use the microphone. I think I will do uh, Basically, there are two parts in the repositories which are developed. One is the framework development, and second is the real data coming. If uh, we go through my presentation, when I was presenting what data is available, for survey, I have not said anything available in that repository in my presentation. Framework we have developed that how that data can be stored. It is going to be different from different kind of surveys. At present, we are restricting to the pilot surveys being conducted for research purposes. For the beginning to understand that how to go about it, framework we, we have developed. And now one survey data, which ISI conducted particularly in Masu, that we have uploaded. Okay? There are issues on that, of the basically micro data of the respondents. I think that was also one of the questions. Uh, India government has its own policy that personal information cannot be shared in the repositories. By mistake, one of the data set, one of the users uploaded, which contain the unique identification numbers. Web scraping tools developed by our country's unique identification authority. With that, I got a mail next day that in your repository, such and such file exists. Kindly remove that file, therefore that we have removed. Therefore those are issues with our data use license that uploading policy has clear cut guidelines that personal data need not, should not be uploaded on the repositories. It should be under restricted access. Uh, the second question was web scrapping tool and uh, interportal harvester. Interportal har web scrapping tool, uh, basically we are, both we are using for two different purposes. Web scrapping tool for Python scripts we are using for microdata downloading, particularly all issues have weather repositories, they are uploading that on a daily basis. Rather than asking them to upload to the repository, we are using web scrapping tool for updating the observational data repository. Interportal harvester uh, is thing, the open access, open archive uh, internet access protocols are already available. They are also a kind of web scrapping tool, but this becomes easier to scrap that data, metadata, and put at one place, and it has showed us that review, uh, a particular kind of data set related to agriculture research, we could uh, download the metadata standard for unified search. That is the basic thing that it is. Uh, then uh, I can take her question as Yeah, of course, please. Yeah, the, the question was on restricted access, what is the criteria for microdata, and the problem of respondents I have already answered. Uh, the restricted access is, when I say unit level data, unit level data means that if there are experiments conducted at every plot, we have the data points, that is unit level data. And that is part of the category of micro data. Therefore, access to that we give to the data generators who have generated the data, they have the access, that is the meaning of restricted access, and their team. And this we put under embargoes, say for three or four years, they only have the access, so that they can bring out publications, whatever data they have generated. After three to four years, it comes to the institutional access, and then 
it comes to the uh, global access. Therefore, this is the policy which uh, guidelines we have put in, but we have started working only for last three, four years. Therefore, all those data which were in micro data in history characters, they are available with the researcher Z project. But slowly, because embargo period is somewhere three years, somewhere four years, somewhere five years, they will come up to the general repositories. Uh, regarding there was another uh, question on administrative data uh, related to, I, I, uh, that does not pertain to my presentation, but uh, Government of India has a Right to Information Act. And under that act, most of the government offices, at least related to government servant uh, data, particularly related to the service conditions and the pay states, individually are being uploaded on the respective websites. That is the guidelines of the government. Okay. Thank you. I uh, just wanted to uh, make two um, remarks. One uh, is that, uh, um, responding also to our colleague of, Indi of uh, Ethiopia, uh, agricultural surveys can also be uh, quite uh, um, problematic in terms of uh, identification of respondents, especially for certain areas uh, regarding the type of crops or the size of the farm that is uh, considered. So when we, uh, we have carefully considered uh, this type of uh, um, a situation in uh, disseminating agricultural survey. And so if you want, we can have a discussion on what type of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, mechanism can be put in place in order not to, uh, uh, to avoid disclosing uh, personal information. Uh, I want to say also, however, that uh, a certain risk of uh, disclosure it's always there. You cannot avoid 100% uh, uh, the uh, risk that uh, information uh, can be disclosed. And uh, the important thing is that when you discover this, you act immediately in order to uh, uh, compensate for this. And to, but you have to accept certain level of uh, risk because otherwise you, you, you may well, well be, uh, keep all your data in your drawer and then you have no risk to <laughs> of, uh, of uh, disclosing personal information. So, and this to me is not the, the, the right policy. The second point is that I would like to uh, 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 highlight is that uh, um, it is a, a problem that I found in all the presentations that were presented today. We continue to talk about open data, but we don't say anything on how many people are using our data. And so uh, when we establish an open data policy or open up our databases, we should establish at the same time a monitoring system to understand uh, how many people are just browsing the data, downloading the, the, the data, what type of users they are. Uh, say are they coming from the government, from the academia? So, because this is very important for understanding um, the, uh, the actual use of data from, uh, and sometimes we <coughs> overestimate, we tend to overestimate uh, the, the use of data and may you, we may think that the main user may, may be our uh, mainly government institution, whereas uh, mainly our commercial institution that uh, are using our data. Uh, uh, and uh, we have seen it on our databases. Uh, the big, big, big user are the Bloomberg, the, all the big, big shots that are then reusing for commercial purposes the data that, uh, that uh, we publish. And this creates, of course, some problems. So, but uh, it's important, very important, that uh, um, we set up a system for monitoring the use of data. Um, probably this needs also a type of registration system to understand <coughs> what are the users, to collect some information on the type of users and uh, uh, another point that I wanted to make is that uh, we also need to do, after some time, maybe 
survey on the actual impact of the uh, data that we have published. So, uh, uh, and this is important for uh, building the business case for open data, for uh, convincing the, the, the our senior management, uh, uh, the, the, the policy makers, that uh, these data actually have helped to improve the life of the people in the end. So uh, it's important that data don't remain closed in our drawer. Thank you very much. And I ask for a big round of applause for the presenters and the speakers. Thank you. Uh, at the end of the session, I would like to thank uh, the, uh, the chair of this session, Petro Ganari, for con uh, conducting this session. And the tea will be served at uh, outside the hall, uh, the lift, and the next session will start 4 p.m. in this hall. Thank you. <laughs>